All right, so without further ado, we want to learn about the history of microphones. And we want to learn about me not putting my lips on this microphone, how my peas. So let's have a warm welcome for Bill Sukowski. So it's really a poor choice for music. 
And the problem you have is when you have a constant voltage applied to the carbon granules, um, it'll either heat up or if there's no movement, they start developing a hiss. And that's, I'm sure in the early days, how people started blowing into microphones just to get rid of that hiss. Uh, and also the granules can get compacted, which means the microphone will not even reproduce sound. Uh, classic example is that in one of the MASH episodes, uh, they couldn't hear the guy on the radio, so he actually, you know, bangs on the microphone. That's what you have to do sometimes to get the carbon granules free to reestablish the, uh, you know, the, the, the resistance so it's not a dead short and it will produce uh, sound by pressure from the light. Uh, some common examples, uh, show you recognize the telephone, they call it a transmitter. It's actually just a single button carbon microphone. And then you got you, you push the talk microphone that you use for tour radio. And then uh, you have these military throat microphones, uh, which are really good because you can lower the sensitivity of the microphone so as not to pick up background noise and just pick up the vibrations from your throat. So they do work very well for military applications. Uh, an improvement over the single button carbon microphone, which is the one I just described, is a double button. So you have uh, two, you know, essentially two, two cups of carbon and a diaphragm is linked between the two cups. And you apply the load through the center tap of the transformer. So essentially you have a push-pull type of mechanism with the granules. Uh, of when one set of granules conducts, the other conducts even less. And you want it with a push-pull operation which will give you a better frequency response, which is what they started using later on in a, for, for broadcasting. Uh, for example, this is a, this is a double body carbon microphone here, and you, know, you have one wire connected to the front, one to the back, and that way you would get a better response, and you know, it, it, for the technology today, that's what they use for broadcasting. Uh, so, you had an advantage that it was better response, but you still had the problem with the uh, granules, you know, hissing and creating noise. But for technology of the day, that's the best they could do. Um, these are examples of double button carbon microphones, like one I just showed you, uh, and they would put a you know, ornate cover on it, uh, so it would look nice, like on stage. But in the center, it's in the, in the inside is still the same double button microphone. And here's Herbert Hoover using one with the cover uh, around 1925. Okay, the next development microphones was the condenser microphone. And uh, actually it came around uh, telephone, the telephone company actually was the inventor of the carbon microphone. It's one of the many, many inventions that came out of Bell Labs. And uh, the carbon microphone, uh, sorry, the condenser microphone uh, it has a lower output, but it gives you much better frequency response, and it was a big improvement over the carbon microphone. And with a condenser microphone, it's actually, uh, it is a you know, two plates of a condenser, and one of the plates is actually the diaphragm that the sound hits, and the early condenser microphones would actually have what they call phantom power supply. So the lead that's going to the microphone carrying the audio uh, away from the microphone is also carrying high voltage, sometimes hundreds of volts, through the diaphragm to create the, uh, you know, too close to it uh, because of the thin diaphragm, they're very sensitive to pops and accentuating, you know, the, the P's, that's what sometimes you see, like uh, sometimes they put a, a windscreen on it or a pop filter. If you'll ever notice uh, in a recording studio, uh, in front of the microphone, they'll have like a little round disc, which is preventing the breath from hitting the microphone, yet not influencing the uh, fidelity of the sound. Uh, some of the uh, microphones, uh, you have very expensive microphones like Neumann. Uh, here's a microphone that it currently, uh, you know, it's going for about six thousand dollars. Very, very good microphones. Uh, Telefunken, uh, Neumann. Uh, um, one of the two of them. Rode is a newer company. Now you can get a, a Rode microphone for $300. There's the, the breath filter, like I explained to you earlier. 
And I have one on display here. I picked up uh, MCM, you know, put out a sale catalog. And here's a carbon microphone made in China. I got it for $35. <laughs> Sounds halfway decent. You know, I'm sure it's not as good as a $6,000 mic. Sorry. But it uh, does, you know, <coughs> uh, This is uh, one of the first carbon mics made. This is the, the Western Electric one. And the mic is 18 inches tall. Okay? The microphone itself up here is just the condenser element. And the tubular device here contains an amplifier with a tube, a transformer. And it's something by small panels. So uh, it is like 1928, about when these were first made. Uh, the Germans had a very similar mic. And if you've ever seen film footage of the Fuhrer speaking, he's speaking in front of something very similar to that. But you know, it was a great invention at the time. They used this in studios. You can see those studios of the day. So it was a big improvement over the uh, carbon mic. For, you know, for especially for broadcasting. Uh, a new development uh, it came out, uh, I guess the, the microphone started coming uh, available around the uh, mid 60s. Mm -hmm. It's called a Lectret condenser microphone. And uh, it was, uh, came out of the Bell again too. And what, it, how, what they are is a, the sound pressure strikes a diaphragm but one plate of the capacitor is actually <laughs> holds it holds a static charge. Uh, it, it's it's it's, it's a magic. I, I don't understand it. Popular electronics back in the 70s, I think, had an article how to make one. Mm. And it involved aluminum foil and paraffin and a flyback from a transformer, from a TV, I should say, and you created a static charge by using like 20,000 volts on this capacitor that was made of aluminum foil and wax and it held a charge. Yeah. It worked. I searched uh, uh, what's it called? American History. I forget there's a website that has all popular electronics on, online. I couldn't find it. I do remember seeing it, but I cannot locate it. Uh, the advantage is it's a lot cheaper to make than the, uh, the expensive, the, the higher quality uh, condenser mics. They're very small and they lend themselves to little mics you may see on an announcer on his collar or his, his, uh, t uh, his shirt. And a very unobtrusive, pretty good frequency response to the size. And for voice for TV, they're fine. You know, they're really like the music reproduction, but for voice frequencies, they're fine. Uh, usually within the microphone itself, because like I said, the capacitor or the condenser in the microphone basically has a very low output of the condenser unit, there's usually an FET amplifier built in the capsule. Uh, the ca and you can buy these, I've seen them on eBay, you get 10 of them for a dollar. That's how cheap they are these days. And you put a resistor, you put a resistor to the voltage, a capacitor for the output, and you know, they, they work. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, some uh, examples, uh, that's like the capsule, like I said, you know, now the you get these under a dollar and you know, they make them in China, they probably cost them you know, three and a half cents to make, you buy know, 10 for a dollar on eBay. Uh, this is a similar mic, but it's broadcast quality, and it's what TV announcers, news broadcasters would use. So, you know, it, uh, <coughs> many times you're going to be wearing one of these, and if you've ever seen like Larry King, or they'll have you know, a prop mic on the desk, they'll have one of the RC-77s, They'll have this on the desk, and really that's the active mic. And if you have a good eye, and my wife gets annoyed when I say this, I'll find discrepancies, or and I'll say they'll have that cheap Japanese mic that looks like the RCA mic, yeah. and they'll have it there as a prop, yeah. especially on the infomercials at night. You watch them selling anything, not an infomercial, and that's what they're using as a mic. Uh, Electro Place, which is a you know name brand manufacturer microphones. Uh, has a studio electric mic and six hundred dollars for electric, but you know I, I guess uh, you know the name's behind it and it is a better mic, so it eliminates the problem. You can actually make an electric mic that has the battery built into it or run off a double A battery for months, but usually for broadcast purposes they will still use what's called phantom power, 
and run on power supply, only supplying them a couple of volts, not hundreds of volts. Okay, uh, the next mic uh, was really the basic, uh, the basic cheap microphone. Uh, it's called a crystal microphone, and uh, a static, which is a microphone manufacturer, uh, were the people that invented the crystal mic back in 1933. And it's a type of uh, crystal called Rochelle salt. And uh, it's similar to a crystal that's used for you know, ham radios, CD radios. Crystals have a property, if you excite them with voltage, they'll vibrate. Conversely, if you twist the crystal, it'll generate voltage. So that's the basic principle behind how a crystal microphone works. You have your diaphragm that gets hit by the sound, is connected to a little piece of Rochelle salt, which looks like a little piece of mica, very small piece, and it generates an output. The problem is they have super limited frequency response, they sound terrible, they're very cheap though, so you know, when portable tape recorders first came out, that's what they gave you. They gave you a $2 crystal microphone, I have one on display here, you know, uh, which is similar to what they would give you with a um, uh, you know, tape recorder. The disadvantage is, uh, besides the frequency response, crystal microphones are very sensitive to temperature variations. They can't take low temperatures, they can't take heat. So anybody now selling micro crystal microphones, uh, odds are if you buy an antique that was made in the 50s, it's not going to work. Uh, for example, this microphone here, uh, it's, a, uh, it's an imitation of the RCA microphone. This was sold by Lafayette Radio and many others for like five dollars back in the 60s. Uh, they were made in Japan and they were, had different names on them. Fentone, Calran, Argo, Lafayette. And it was all hype. You know, they call broadcast quality. It ain't. <laughs> and what they actually did was, inside the microphone, inside the microphone, uh, here's, the, here's the end, okay? It's 495 in Lafayette, and that's the picture of that mic over there. What they did was, the, the element, or the, the sound sensing device, it's called an element in the microphone, they actually put two of them in there, and they build it as double the output. You put two microphone cartridges in parallel, you don't double, you don't double the output, by no means. But uh, they were big in the 50s, 60s, uh, CB operators loved them, they, you know, could have a higher output. I mean, you can get a crystal mic and put out something up to like a quarter of a volt, which is a very high output, so um, you didn't need much amplification. Uh, CPUs loved them. This is a very popular crystal microphone. It's iconic. It's a D104. Uh, came out in 1933. Uh, and I think in 1976, they made a, what they call it, a Golden Eagle version. They actually made a gold version of it. And then they stopped making it in 2001. Uh, it's called a lollipop mic. It's a very high output mic. Uh, microphone outputs are rated in uh, dB, uh, dBD, not dBm like you know, power. And most microphones put out like about a mi minus 55 dBd, uh, which is millivolts. The, as the D104 here put out like, like a minus 40, which is a lot bigger than minus 55. It's about 15 dBd, but it's a, it'll be much bigger increase in uh, <coughs> voltage. Uh, sure made a medium quality crystal microphone here, uh, which of course also is ripped off by the Japanese, there's a version up here. Uh, so you could buy the, the Sure one here for $25, or the one from Lafayette for $3.95. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? All right, uh, the most popular microphone out there today is the uh, dynamic microphone. Uh, it, uh, it's, it, they call it usually a moving coil microphone, and uh, all it is, you have, it's basically a loudspeaker in reverse. Uh, you have a diaphragm with a voice coil around a magnet, so when the sound hits the diaphragm, the diaphragm moves, and the magnet, you know, creates the field, and you wind up with an output voltage from the coil. The problem was when, you know, they first invented the carbon, the dynamic microphone, Magnets weren't as strong as they are today. Now, even compared to 20, 30 years ago, now they have a couple rare earth magnets, which are much more powerful than the original magnets. So the original dynamic microphones 
just like the electromagnetic standards and radios, you need a voltage to create the magnetic field. So the problem is you had to generate a high field, and they would use batteries, and sometimes they would join four amps just to drive the, the microphone. So it became impractical until later on when uh, magnets became more get stronger, if they made them better, and so today the dynamic, dynamic microphone is probably the most rugged you can have for broadcasting. Uh, you know, they, they drop, you look at any broadcast microphone that's been used by a studio over a year, it's got nicks, dings, scratches, pieces of falling off of it, and they still work. Mm -hmm. So they are very rugged, they can be made small, and the problem with the dynamic microphone is uh, the frequency response is influenced by <coughs> many things. Also, close speaking. When you talk close to the microphone, not this microphone here, um, you accentuate the bass. And that's usually a problem more with mic dynamics, but it's a problem with any microphone close talking. And later on, there's a technology to get around that. So that's kind of the downside. You're going to get better frequency response from the condenser microphone or what's called a ribbon right approach, which I'm going to get to the next. Uh, you have your iconic called Elvis mic. Uh, hmm. uh, uh, sure came out with this in 1939. Uh, it caught on. It, it's, it's still in production. Now that now they've made the... I, I bought the, the newer one uh, about 10, 15 years ago, made in Mexico. <coughs> now they're probably made in China. But I, I, don't, I can't speak for them. But uh, these mics have been around for years. Uh, it's called the Elvis mic. Uh, you go to the Shure microphone page, they've got a whole paper written on this particular microphone. It just became accepted as the symbol of a microphone. If you look at any t-shirt or anybody, American Idol, if you look at anybody putting up a poster advertising somebody and holding a microphone, it's going to be a mic resembling that. The other not as popular, but uh, another iconic mic you'll see very much on TV is this Electro Voice called the Model 666. Uh, it was actually a studio version uh, that you, you'll see if you look at any newscasts back from the 50s or 60s, you're going to see probably that microphone. Uh, I was just looking at a, uh, I think, a What's My Line on YouTube the other day. Uh, Somebody sent me a link for Groucho Marx on YouTube. Anyway, that's what they were using. So this mic was so popular, Electro Voice actually came out with a PA version, a 664. And it's, if you notice, it has similar char characteristics. And what this microphone did, uh, these microphones uh, have different directional characteristics. Obviously, you know, you get too close to a speaker, you know, you get feedback. So what Electro Voice did uh, in these microphones, these microphones have three sound openings. Uh, actually, four to include the main one. Okay, this is where the sound goes in when you speak. You got openings on the side. There's an opening right at the back here and an opening up here. And each one of those openings is tuned for a specific frequency. So by doing that, Electro Voice was able to alter the, the pickup characteristic of the microphone, giving what's called a cardioid pattern meaning it picks up 95% from the front and very little from the back. So it is a directional microphone. Uh, this is another very very popular microphone, uh, 635A. Uh, I've got ENG, electronic news gathering. Electric voice like it sells you by the case. You go out, you buy 10 of them. And you buy 10 of these microphones for probably $300 and they throw away. You know, they use them for TV broadcast and if it gets damaged, they leave it in the garbage can. It's, they're expendable. Uh, it's not a bad sounding mic. Now this microphone is what's called omnidirectional. It'll pick up mic sounds in all directions, but it's not normally used for PA purposes where you have a feedback issue with a speaker. It's used by a reporter in the street. So you know the directional characteristics aren't that important for a, uh, a reporter doing an interview on the street or reporting from you know crime scene or whatever. Okay, uh, the next microphone type is. Um, it's called a ribbon microphone. Uh, back in the 20s, uh, these two guys, uh, Schottky and Gerlach, came up with the idea of a, uh, a ribbon microphone, also called a velocity microphone. And uh, it's 
one of the better quality microphones uh, south to sound. You probably can't beat a ribbon. Uh, the, they work on the same principle as a, uh, a dynamic microphone, but instead of having a diaphragm moving coil through a magnet, you have a very strong magnet here, and you have a corrugated piece of aluminum. Very thin. I mean, we're talking, uh, that, that used to be something we did in school. You had to get uh, like, some Wrigley's gum and peel foil away from the paper, and you get that really thin aluminum. <coughs> it's thinner than that. A super thin, corrugated foil. And they just run this foil between the poles of the magnet. And because it's only a piece of foil, the, the resistance, you're talking less than an ohm. You're talking a tenth of an ohm, probably. But uh, the advantage is it it's had a very good frequency pickup. Um, it's very delicate, but the advantage is if it's used in a studio environment, that usually isn't a problem. You don't blow into a ribbon microphone. You don't use them out in the wind. Uh, <laughs> when, I was in, uh, when I was in high school, they actually had a version of a little microphone, which I have on display here, that they used in schools. And I'm sure these things would beat the hell. Mm -hmm. And they work, but who knows how well they work. Right? The problem they also have with the ribbon microphone is this ribbon, because it's just suspended, it's actually held with like two clamps. And you got this piece of ribbon hanging there. So over the years, with weight, you know, as years go on, things say it. Leave it at that. <laughs> Actually, Rick, Rich Phoenix and I both used uh, RCA ribbon mics at WRAN. Yeah. They, they all failed. What did them in was cigarette smoke. Hmm. Yeah. It was lethal to the ribbon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because they literally would blow the smoke right into it. Right. They had the cigarette right when they were talking. Yeah. Wasn't the guys on the radio really replacing the smoke? I'm sorry? Right? Wasn't the ribbon Wasn't typically really replaceable? Yeah. The ribbons are replaceable. I mean, it, it's a market now. It's a little cottage industry. Yeah. Uh, there's one guy called uh, Enac, which is a guy named Kane, well, spelled backwards. And <laughs> you can send him your old RC microphone and he'll put a ribbon in it. Mine is a display. I don't use it for broadcasting, so I'm not going to go through the expense of changing a ribbon. Darren's average? Well, yeah. you mentioned 635 days. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Is it possible to break the 635? I've always thought of the... I'm sure they could. I'm sure you could. As a matter of fact, um, back to this mic here. I'll just go back a second. This is 664. <coughs> Electro voice uh, originally... Uh, there were, were various locations, but they were for the longest <clears throat> time in Buchanan, Michigan. And these mics, the 664 here, I have them on display. Uh, the casing of the 664 is a very heavy cast metal, as opposed to the broadcast one here, which is very thinner. So this microphone was so heavy, they actually nicknamed it the Buchanan Hammer. And there is a uh, and for electro voice with a guy banging a nail into a piece of wood yeah. with that microphone. Because oh, yeah. you, you look at the mic up here, it's it's heavy, it probably weighs three or four pounds. Uh, I'm sure it didn't work as well after they drove a you know, 10 heavy nail on the 2x4, but uh, that was the selling point of that microphone. And like Derek said, the 635, it's not a rugged mic. I mean, it's rugged in so much as the design of the dynamic element makes it rugged, but it's a very lightweight case, it doesn't weigh much at all, weighs probably a couple of ounces, but they are well made, they have good sound, and they were just expendable, yes. One interesting thing that's common to the electric voice and to the RCA mics yeah. is they had two versions of very similar mics, uh, one for use on TV, mm -hmm. one for use in a studio or outside, and it was a matter of the case of the microphone. They wouldn't go for a shiny job like the 664 right. for being on camera. For all well, they have one on display here. That's right. Yeah. But they would go for something with, with a dull finish on, like the 666 there. Right. Or either 635A. They both have dull finishes that will not reflect. Right, right. And uh, this, actually, the 635 is used all use black. Yeah. Right. The, 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 the 635, a lot of them against mics, came in different colors. They had like, a fawn beige and a gray. Mm -hmm. Neither of which reflected and was good for TV. Right. What I have on display here, uh, when Electric Voice made these mics, the 666 was the studio version. This was the PA version. Mm -hmm. In between them, at a 665. So the 665 was 
not as good as 656. <laughs> it was a better quality mic. They used a Canon connector, which is a studio type connector, yeah. as opposed to the you know, one of the, the very common Amphenol that this used. The other thing, uh, Electro Voice used this really difficult to obtain connector. It's called a UA3 connector. Uh, the Ray Chase, somebody coined the word unobtainium, uh, you always hear? You, you try to get those UA3 connectors, you can pay 50, 60 bucks just for that connector now if you want to get it. They're very difficult. You look at it, it looks like a kind of connector. It's got three pins, but they're off by a silly millimeter. They won't fit. <laughs> and, you know, people have you know, bastardized the mics, forced the kind of connector in there, changed it. But, you know, it was it's just a, it's a rugged connector. I, mean, it, I think it's, if you look at the specs for that UA3 connector, it actually has a voltage like a current rating. You know, it can handle 120 volts at 5 amps. So it's not designed for you know, AC, but it's a very heavy connector that they have ultimately wisely you know, discontinued. So back to the ribbon mic. Uh, the, this is actually a picture of the ribbon in the microphone. If you look closely, uh, you can see the little corrugations. It's mounted between two little brackets. And there's actually a, such a very small voltage generated by the microphone, but it is enough to, you know, Trans, you know, transport the voice, and uh, it has a very good frequency response because the mass of that rhythm is so light, as opposed to a diaphragm that's rigid and you know <laughs> something that's stiff or rigid will not trans, you know, doesn't vibrate as easily. So you're not going to get your low frequencies through there. I mean, so you look at a tweeter versus a woofer. A woofer has a softer cone. A tweeter sometimes has a mylar cone or a hard cone. So a ribbon mic having a very pliable sound generating element, in this case the ribbon, will give you a much better frequency response. And also by talking closely into that mic, again you accentuate the bass, which sometimes is good for broadcasting if you want to, you know, probably NPR people use that because they always sound like they're <laughs> up close to the mic. Uh, problem, like I said earlier, the, the, the ribbon mic is a very sensitive to wind. And you guys blow on that, and you can actually wipe out the corrugations, and you wind up with a limp piece of metal in there, which you know isn't going to generate any sound whatsoever. Uh, <clears throat> again, using the word iconic, you know, a lot of mics have gone down through history, and people associate them broadcasting. Uh, the RCA 44, uh, this uh, went through many generations. Uh, it came out of the 44, 44BX, 44 B. Uh, again, kind of pricey, you know, uh, here in the 50s, it went for, uh, you know, $129 back in the, uh, the 50s. The 44BX here was the last in the generation of the 44s, uh, so that's why they were, they were made up until the 50s, uh, which they finally discontinued, but they were big microphones and they were getting out of the big microphone era. Uh, now, right now, you, can, you look on eBay, I see these close, go sometimes to $4,000 now. Right people want, they're, like I said, it's, it's a symbol, people want them, and you could pay $4,000 for a, you know, 60 year old microphone, that sounds terrible. You know, or you send it to a guy, have a ribbon put in there. But I never did the math, I never looked it up, you know, considering inflation, you know, 1950s, $129, what would that be in today dollars? Probably in the thousands. Yeah. So, again, but people like to collect them. That's some crazy guys got a lot of microphones. Uh, this is the other mic you see a lot, the RC77. Again, again, it's a ribbon microphone. Picture of Elvis using one. This came out after the 70, after the uh, the 44, a little more modern 50s, uh, you know, uh, architecture. And again, these go for a little less money than the 44 these days. You can you can have these for $1,200 uh, if they kind of you know beat. Uh, when I bought mine, uh, I bought mine on eBay back about 1995. And when eBay first started, people were actually listing items without pictures. Mm -hmm. And a guy listed a 77 with no picture. I got it for like 850 bucks. It was a gamble. But e eBay's pretty good. If you buy something that doesn't work, you know, you can haggle, haggle and get your money back. So I took a chance. I paid 850 for it. And it's going to have a decent mic. It is a hip mic, I should say. It does work. And, uh, you know, I got a good deal. And like I said, now they probably start around 1200 
and they just go up. But again, they're very overpriced, people want them, uh, just like the radios for sale in the New York Times. People, you know, people spend it, there. You know, I'm sorry, you know the, the year they finally stopped making those? Oh uh, yeah, uh, they, uh, they discontinued the uh, 77 and 1960, this, this microphone in 1967, they discontinued it. Um, again, the 77 DX is the later version, early versions are maybe one of them, I think the first 77 is about 50% larger than this. And it didn't have the rounded bottom, it actually had a flat bottom, was black, twice the size, but it was, you know, the beginning of an evolution of this particular microphone. Uh, the bottom mic here, um, I picked up one actually at a ham fest. Uh, maybe in Cherryville, I knew the Cherryville ham fest many, many years ago. There was a guy that used to go to our ham fest selling microphones out of a truck. You know, microphone stands, microphones, and I picked it up because it was unique. I got it. It's uh, made by Reslo, which is a UK company, and uh, RB is a series of it, RBH, RBHL, RBW, whatever, depending on whether they have a switch. This one has a switch built in. Uh, the one I have has a switch built in. This one here does have a switch. Some come high peaks, some come low peaks. So I bought the mic just because I liked it. I got the price on it. And then what I didn't realize uh, later on, I discovered that it was the same mic the Beatles used. Uh, Restful mic, uh, you can see it right there. And uh, it was big, uh, you know, the Beatles using this you know, the cavern in 1962. And uh, the website is still there, Reslo Sound, and that's their claim to fame. You know, we have the Elvis mic, they got the Beatles mic. So <laughs> this Reslo mic was the mic that was used by the Beatles. Yeah, that model. Um, this is a, another microphone I threw in here. I have one on display. Um, I call it the best of both worlds. Microphone uh, pickup characteristics are determined by two things, the construction of the microphone and the type of element or transducer in it. When you have a ribbon suspended vertically, it picks up from both sides. So ribbon microphones are normally called bidirectional or figure eight pattern. If you look at a graphic representation, you might, if you look at a spec sheet for a microphone, they give you the pickup characteristics. You know, whether it picks up from all sides, the rejection in the back. So a ribbon microphone, if you look at the, the pickup pattern of a ribbon microphone, it looks like a figure eight. So what Alpec Lansing did, actually Bell Labs did, this microphone originally was uh, built by Bell Laboratories, uh, and they were taken over, uh, they, Western Electric got out of the sound business. I mean, Western, you look at all movies, you know, they'll say Western West Trek sound, Western Electric sound. So Western Electric was big into speakers and microphones. Uh, they made a speaker called the Voice of the Theater, uh, which was an amazing speaker. Uh, I actually have a home version of it called the Blend Singers. My wife wants to get rid of them because of the tables, but I love them. But <laughs> anyway, so Western Electric took over from uh, Altec, uh, I'm sorry, Altec took over from Western Electric, but what what they did was uh, they decided to take the best of two types of microphones. So this microphone here internally has a ribbon and also has a dynamic element. And by moving a switch on the back of the microphone, you can combine the pickup patterns of the microphones. So you can keep it a figure eight, you can put them both on, you can make an omnidirectional microphone, or you can use the dynamic and you can make it a cardioid. So this microphone is, you know, like I said, the best of both worlds. Being a ribbon, it's still susceptible to the, you know, the, the wind problem, but by having the two elements in there, you can change the pickup pattern. Uh, and again, these, you'll see there's a lot of old uh, news broadcasts, Douglas Edwards in the news, you'll see Douglas Edwards, he's using them. And the, again, what Altec, or as Western started, Altec didn't change it, they also had their own proprietary connector. <laughs> the connector is actually up inside the microphone, and if you buy these mics, the two things that are most difficult to get for these microphones are the connector and this yoke. Uh, these mics can be mounted two ways. They have a, a little pipe with the connector built in, which is what I have here, which enables you to mount the microphone onto a, a, you know, a pipe stand, or you can have this yoke. And the yoke has a unique uh, way of connecting. Uh, the microphone has vertical ribs and this yoke actually grabs the ribs and that's what holds it. So it gives you the ability to swivel it 
whereas with the the uh, pipe the pipe mounting that I have, you can't swivel it. Uh, so another thing you talk about, you know, people are using ribbon microphones and not knowing how to handle them. When I was in high school, like in Flushing, New York, they used these on stage. Now, I can't imagine a high school using this microphone on a stage. Talk about overkill. And the other ironic part is, it was a union thing. All wiring schools had to be done by electricians, like licensed electricians. So back in the 60s, or I guess I once they got rid of that stupid UA3 connector, all microphones used what's called a Canon connector. It was an XLR made by Canon, that's what Scrap makes them. And so in schools, they did use the XLRs. They actually used Hubble twist slot AC connectors. Yeah. Yeah. It was had two twist, two blades, one bigger than the other, and a center for ground. Oh, yeah. And the reason was an electrician would come wire them. You, know, you put an electrician in there, like you know, wire the cable guy with him, and have him try to solder an XLR connector. It didn't work. So this is like putting an AC plug on the end of a wire. So you had this, you know, multi-hundred dollar microphone going through a AC connector. You know, with, there was no prompt, no chance of it being plugged into an outlet because it wasn't a typical AC outlet. It was called a twist lock. But uh, that's what they use in schools. But it, you know, it still carried sound. Uh, this is just an example of the different patterns. Uh, you know, here's the cardioid. Uh, this is the figure eight. If you have the ribbon, if you combine them, you get what's called a hypercardioid. Uh, this is uh, actually this is a, this is a hypercardioid. That's called supercardioid, depending on how much pickup pattern you have in the rear. So by changing the pattern within the the, uh, the electrical connections with the microphone, mixing uh, the micro the elements together, you can actually change the pickup pattern. Uh, a little explanation of just the pickup patterns, like I said. Uh, that was all the types of microphones that are out there right now. So these are just examples of different microphones. Uh, this is a uh, Electro Boy 655C. Uh, uh, the two biggest names that use that was Bud Collier, Bud the Clock, and uh, what's it called? Uh, the Clock, Rick and Manscaped. Mm -hmm. That's what they used. They were studio microphones, omnidirectional pickup. And they're rated from like 40 hertz to 20,000 hertz. They're flat, of course, to the yeah, audio. The last crane to the list, he used that too. I'm sorry? Less Crane is that. Less Crane? Okay. So they have superb uh, sound. Again, these days a wonderful thing. I was able to get one. Uh, mine works. I've used it. Sounds good. Um, at the lower end, you have uh, Shure made a crystal microphone. That was an Omni. And again, this I showed you earlier in the presentation, like $20-something dollars. And of course, Lafayette, Calrad, all the others, Phantom. Came with a four dollar version, which didn't sound as good. Cardioid, again, that's where um, you know it'll pick up primarily from the front with very little back pickup. The two biggest examples of the cardioid would be this Sure 55 and the Electro Voice. Uh, the Sure did it not as uh, elaborately as Electro Voice with the, uh, the the chambers, but there were. Uh, Mechanism inside the microphone that would reflect the sound and reject sound from the back. Uh, these early Shure ones, the cartridge was actually mounted on rubber and springs. Uh, now they, this, the element that they use in this microphone that's currently made is the same one they use in their handheld microphone. They just put, put the microphone cartridge in the, the housing and people buy them. I actually picked one up new at uh, I think I got one from Electronics, and uh, no, no. but I, you know. Just to have a newer one. It works. Uh, people say they don't sound as good, but you know, the, and of course, plus the original ones, just due to their, their age and what they've been subjected to, probably don't sound that good anymore anyway. But people want them. And uh, again, you, know, you can buy Japanese ripoffs of them for five, five twenty dollars, and they just look nice. Uh, super cardio weight is just basically a you know, cardio weight pattern. And it's kind of a misnomer because it does pick up more from the back than a regular cardioid. So for some reason they call it a super cardioid. 
And again, you have you know, Assure here, Assure Dynamic Mic, it's called Beta 58, still being still in production, and Electro Voice uh, PL11. I think it's discontinued. Uh, again, that's a super cardioid. Anyway. And again, you have, you have ribbon mics are bidirectional. You got your RCA 77 and the Shure 300. I have a smaller version here, the Shure 333. Uh, Johnny Carson used to use this one. Mm -hmm. He used that. And the 300 uh, is discontinued. Again, ribbon mic. Ribbon mics are very warm. Very pleasing sound, so that's why they were good for broadcasting. I think that'll be it. The two things okay. I can tell you on, on the RCA 77 we were yeah. discussing, the back pickup was so bad, yeah. uh, we had cartridge tape machines, and when you push the button to play the cartridge for your commercial or jingle, they had a pinch roller solenoid. Right. right. And you'd hear that clunk, it would pay the needle yeah. on the board. So we had to put the cart machines down the right hand side of you, uh -huh. so that mic wouldn't pick them. You couldn't have them in front of you. We had to have them inside. Hmm. Right. Because, uh, now that they do in studios, you know, I guess they realize you can't have picked up from yeah. behind the microphone. And as far as the, the ribbon failure, the, the one in the news booth, which was not much bigger than a phone booth, we had an ashtray in there that was always full. <laughs> these guys are in a tidy room, and they were blowing smoke in that all day long. That one lost all its bass response. The one in the production room. Well, the negative commercials changed the, the, the weight of the ribbon. Probably. Well, well, when, when, you, when you get into the production room, we had a guy that smoked cigars all day. And he was in that room all day. So that one lost output completely in less than a year. <laughs> and it's so funny, you know, these, you know, the, the, when he's talking about the 77 or 44, the collectible mics, for a short time back in the 80s, I worked for NBC at 30 Rock. Okay. And I remember I went to this closet once. And they're literally having 30, 40 of these 44 to 77 stacked up in that oh, yeah. closet. Who are they going? Throw one up in the dumpster. Who knows? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're they're popular. popular. You can pick these up used for you know, a couple hundred bucks. Mm. Now, the thousands. Yes, John. Well, I just wanted to mention, Bill, sure. you mentioned Altec uh, Voice of the Theater. Yeah. The e yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, when they did with the voice of the theater, they made a home version of the Valencia. They took the horn that was on top, mounted it inside, and I picked up a pair, and they're awesome. Anyway, uh, this presentation, um, and I'll post a link on Dropbox if you want to look at it, because I did throw some links on here from microphone sites, uh, and catalogs to um, uh, collections. Uh, the two biggest ones out there, uh, there's a website called Kutant, C-O-U-T-A-N-T, and uh, He's got so many mics on there, not for sale, just on display. Huh. And another guy named James Steele, I think his website might be down, but he was another collector of microphones. And um, you go on the internet, you can find anything you want about microphones, how they work, who invented them. Um, also, uh, what I did do, uh, if you do look at this online, remember the first sheet of the presentation had a lot of little black and white pictures. Uh, the last page here, I did wash them out with the names of the people. <laughs> so, if you want to find out who they are. Uh, get the cane? <laughs> Ready? Yeah. Okay, any questions anywhere? Any questions? Any qu yeah, John. No, like, just who was the first person? It was an Alexander Graham Bell. Who was the first person to convert sound? It, it, it was this guy, uh, <laughs> Berliner, I think. It was. Wheatstone. Well, Wheatstone invented the word. Wheatstone? But they said, well, well, he invented the word microphone. Yeah, you know, I guess like the television. Yeah, he, was, he was the first guy. Well, he, he didn't invent the microphone. He came with the word microphone. But this guy, Berliner, he made the first microphone. Um, and uh, how I, I couldn't find out how he did it. We all should see it, Alexander Graham Bell with a microphone, with a telephone, but he was a pickle, right? So later on, they went from Whisper to Carmen. But Berliner, I've heard the name. I don't, I know exactly why this microphone was. It was liquid, it was cold, it was, you know, fuzz, <laughs> mint. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what he had in there. But it, it's, it's a interesting. In this subject, uh, I like tolerance. Hey, I know I I go to the AWA meets in Rochester. I know we got a bunch coasters. So.
five percent also. <laughs> you gotta you gotta realize how much work goes into these presentations and Bill uh, it took him too much time just to do this presentation. <laughs> nice. Yeah. To create or to do it? <laughs> Uh, again, we are very fortunate that we have talented people amongst us, and that's why I'd like to mine our own talents and uh, give our presentations from our own groups instead of bringing outside people. So, uh, again, Bill, thanks so much. Okay, also, if you have any questions, you know, ask me anything about the mics up here, I can explain anything if you'd like. All right. Well, we do need to move along, and we will have an auction. And the Never auction, mind. And the auction seems to be growing, okay? So, uh, let's have our auction. Uh, you can certainly ask Bill anything you want, but I really want to move along with the auction. So uh, stick around for the auction, guys. Some good stuff there. I'm just not going to be able to do it. I'm just not going to be able to do it. I'm just not going to be able to do it. I'm just not going to be able to do it. I'm just not going to be able to do it. I'm just not going to be able to do it. I'm just not going to be able to do it. I'm just not going to be able